Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the webinar series of the Center for Volcanology and Geological Hazard Mitigation of Indonesia. I'm uh, Devi Kamil Shahbana. I will be your host throughout this webinar session. Today, we will have a talk uh, from Dr. Uh, Thomas Lecoq of the Royal Observatory of Belgium who will present a very interesting topic entitled uh, the open source and open data pushing science uh, forward. So before uh, we begin with the presentation, allow me to share my screen. So, uh, this webinar will be uh, done in one and about one and a half hours. So uh, this way, uh, before we start with the presentation, uh, we would like to uh, introduce about this webinar. So this uh, webinar is held by the Center for Volcanology and Geological Hazard Mitigation of Indonesia uh, in response to the uh, conditions, the current conditions of the pandemic of the COVID-19. So this is part of our way to reach the public, to share knowledge and to give a uh, public education in the field of geological disasters. And uh, before we start, uh, we would like to uh, uh, to give a brief uh, introduction to our institution. So this year is very special for us because uh, we uh, commemorate uh, the 100 years of volcano monitoring in Indonesia. It has been uh, quite a, a long uh, milestone that we have achieved. Uh, the volcanological uh, survey has been established uh, since the Netherlands East Indies government in 1920, and then uh, it was moved to the uh, Japanese authority, the Kazan Chozabu from uh, 1942 to 45. And in 1945 to now, uh, it is in the hands of Indonesian government. And it is our institution now is known as the Center for Volcanology and Geological Hazard Mitigation. And uh, currently we give uh, uh, service about the information for geohazards uh, that includes uh, volcanic eruptions, earthquakes, tsunami, and also landslides. All of this information can be achieved through our website on uh, https uh, magma.esdm.go.id. So uh, before we start, uh, let me also give you a, a brief uh, introduction to the guideline uh, of the uh, webinar. So all the participants uh, can ask uh, questions during and after the speaker's uh, presentation. And uh, but the, the, uh, the, the presenters will only answer that after the presentation is completed. And uh, the participants uh, should ask uh, questions that is related to the topic. Uh, and uh, if you have any questions other than the topic, please ask through the uh, chat box. But if the questions is for the uh, speakers, then please ask that through the Q and I box. Or if you are watching this uh, on YouTube, then you can ask through the live comment on YouTube. And uh, for this webinar, we will provide e-certificates as well as the uh, presentation file. And the links for these uh, materials will be given in the end of the presentation. So uh, please uh, keep following uh, this webinar. Uh, and in the end, uh, this webinar will be finished about uh, on, on uh, 3 p.m. Uh, Jakarta time. So, and uh, for those who will, uh, will need the, the presentation file, uh, the link will be given in the end. So we will talk about uh, a little bit about Thomas, Dr. Thomas Lecoq. His uh, full name is Thomas Yves René Lecoq. So he, uh, he was born in uh, Belgium. Uh, 
24th September 1983. So in two days, he will uh, celebrate his uh, birthday. So uh, happy birthday, Thomas. And uh, and then uh, he, he, he worked a lot uh, in the science of seismology, but he is also a very prominent Python programmer. So uh, he has uh, contributed a lot in science, uh, mostly in seismology. Uh, not particularly at uh, volcanology, but uh, he worked uh, in volcanology and also for uh, the tectonic seismology. And also he, he gave so much contribution for the uh, improvement of, of seismological tools. Uh, if you see on, 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 on his uh, publications, all are worth readings. And uh, one of his masterpieces is the MS Noise uh, software. It's an open source software made uh, to analyze seismic data. And he will give this uh, presentation as well. And Toma also a very uh, important contributor for uh, 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 a very, uh, how to say, very important uh, Python package for seismologists, the, the, the OBSPY. So, uh, so there are a lot of things that we will learn from Toma today. And uh, Toma is here already. Uh, Toma, can you open your uh, video? So Hi. yeah, Toma is uh, there already and uh, he will give a presentation of about 45 minutes and, and then we will have a session for all the participants uh, for about uh, 30 to 40 minutes. Please, Toma, the time is yours. You can share your screen and start the presentation. Okay, thank you. So first of all, I want to thank you uh, for the, uh, the invitation to, to be part of this uh, webinar series. Um, the um, time of the year and, and the epoch we are living and hopefully going through all together uh, in good health, um, it brings new challenges and, and for sure uh, somehow we can tackle and we can um, change things, ways we, 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 we discuss and way we share data, we share information, uh, we share knowledge as, as David said. Uh, this is important for, for me and I mean probably uh, I wouldn't have made it to Indonesia to give this presentation so it's a, it's a big honor to be part of this uh, 100 years uh, seminar series. Um, so my presentation is will be about open source open data that will be the kind of like the, um, the background wire that we will follow through it but I will not specifically talk about it I will spoke, speak about results of it um, but the way everything I show is built on, on, on those uh, key elements of, of sharing science, which is open source and open data. Um, so I will give an introduction to, to MS Noise. As, as uh, David Chabana said, it's, it's a, a long-term uh, project that we've been uh, running and I've been coding um, partially on my free time and then at the observatory. And then I will give you some words about uh, a recent uh, publication we made together with, with a lot of people from the world during the pandemic to also show that collaboration uh, and new elements, new ways to work uh, can arise from, from dramatic moments like we are living uh, in 2020. So first, yeah, let me, let me talk a little bit about MS Noise. So it's called a tool to process seismic noise, but maybe, maybe some of you don't know what seismic noise is. So I just took the liberty to put two or three slides about it. So this is a, a spectrum or, or if you want a periodogram. So we are showing a, the amplitude of the seismic noise versus the period of the oscillations of the ground. So this is typically what a seismometer will record continuously somewhere. This is in, in this case is somewhere in Germany. And you can see from the time span at the, at the top that it is 30 years of data. And so you see that the density uh, of, of um, occurrence of, of noise level at this station is very stable through time. In 30 years, you see that the span here, for example, a two seconds period would be something like 10 decibels, which is very, very uh, small difference. And, and so this general shape of the noise that you record everywhere on the planet Earth, you have um, basically the same elements everywhere. You have a strong peak here that we call a secondary micro seism that is linked to oceans. And I will come back to that in a second. You have a small peak here that is a primary micro seism. And then you have shorter periods and longer periods. And at shorter periods, you see that there is a big spread that you have kind of baseline and sometimes you have more high frequency noise. So long, short period would be high frequency. And then here at long period, you have this slope here that is also linked to some atmospheric and long-term things. 
And so if we look at these, these bands, so you have this magenta pink band and this green band. So it's taking, we are taking this frequency or this period. And then we are looking now at this through time. And you can see here that the pink color, which is high frequency, we can see that there are weekly cycles. So the gray bars are weekends. And you can see that usually, so this is a place in Germany, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday are quite busy and Sunday is quiet. But then you can also see that Easter Monday is a day off in Germany. So this is a signature that you can say, okay, this in this frequency band, I have a suspicion that I have a part of anthropogenic noise. So it is generated by humans, human activities. On the other hand, the green bar here shows that you have from January to July, you seem to have something that goes down and you don't have these weekly cycles anymore. So there are few chances that you have a lot, you can have some contribution, but there's few chances there's a lot of seismic noise generated by humans at this seven second band, which is in the secondary micro seism at the peak of it. But then you see that in January it's higher and in July it's lower. And that is a signature that is linked to the ocean, the North Atlantic Ocean. So this station is in Germany. We are subject to the North, Northern Hemisphere weather. And in the winter, there is more energy in the ocean. There is also more wind. And that, tra that transfers into the ground. And then we can record it with seismometers. And so depending on the frequency band we are looking at, we are looking at different noise contributions. Can be human, uh, can it be induced by wind, can be done by oceans. So this is an example of rough seas that generate seismic waves. So they generate at first ocean waves that travel um, in, across the oceans. But then these, these ocean waves can also travel. And if you, if you have this wave train going to a coast and then being reflected at the coast, then you have two opposite wave trains that have almost the same frequency or equal frequency, uh, equal period. And these generate a pressure at the bottom of the ocean. And this pressure generates Rayleigh waves, so surface waves, that transmit into the ground, into the earth, sorry, in the upper crust, um, and then transmit all, all over the, the world. Of course, you have stronger hits at the coast, you have strong um, rogue waves also, the, all these elements and rough weather generate low frequency seismic noise, which we call the natural oceanic primary or secondary micro seism, one being the double frequency of the other. So, at high frequency, we have a mix of things. We have wind that generates a coupling with structures, being trees, buildings, uh, other, other elements. Um, and then you also have humans. We are making a lot of noise at the surface of the Earth. And we are trying, of course, since forever to put our seismometers away from cities, but we still needed to have power. We still needed to have connections to the internet or to the, to the telephone cable at the B origin. So we are not very, very far from cities and also cities and, and countries are crowded. I mean, uh, putting a station in Bandung is, is, a, is a challenge for sure. So if we look at, at the spectrum of, of noise through time, we see that there is, so this is a spectrogram if you want. So we take the power spectral densities, the spectrum we see before, and we put them, each column of this image is one hour. And you see that for uh, a month here in 2018 in Belgium, we have strong things strong energy in the seismic noise in the frequencies to between uh, two and 10 seconds, which is in the primary secondary micro seism, mostly secondary micro seism. And you see that there are some fine information that we can extract from. You see that we go from short period to longer period. In this case also here, it's more massive. So these elements are the signatures of probably weather related, ocean related information. This is winter again in Northern hemisphere. So we are under the, the, um, the uh, weather of the North Atlantic Ocean, which is quite rough in winter. But then also here between uh, minus 10 minus one and, and 10, so it's been like one hertz to 10 hertz. We have, you see here, these dark lines here. These are nights. And then we have weekends. And so what we can see here is that the human contribution is also there. So with this noise stability of it looks like the noise of the ocean is quite continuous, but there's some information in there. And then it looks like the human activity is, is strong, but then also there is information we can extract. So I'm first going to talk about um, later to, in the presentation of both the natural noise and what we can make out of it, and then some applications with the human noise. So back to MS noise now. So this is a, uh, a package say, um, to process seismic data. And 
originally was really to make only velocity variation uh, estimations, but it, it turned out to be a, a kind of a framework for analyzing continuous seismic data because it's, it's expandable to different problems. So it started a long, long, long time ago, um, basically a few years after I met Davy. Um, in 2010, Corentin Caudron did his PhD uh, at the Observatory of Belgium and University of Brussels. And he was working in Indonesia on the Kawaijin volcano uh, together with the, uh, the CVGHM. Um, and the USGS later uh, joined the project also, and then continued uh, monitoring and helping you guys uh, with providing good instruments and, and, and telemetry, for example, that we also uh, developed there. So Corentin had the data, and there were not so many, many seismic events. It was a bit tough. So he contacted Florent Bringuet. At the time, he just published a paper in science. Um, and Florent said, yeah, OK, guys, um, it's cool. You have a volcano. You have data. I have the technique. So let me just send you a big, a big tar GZ file um and just just do your way do do something with it uh, so he sent us the code which was a nightmare because it was like c shell matlab fortran uh, c stuff everything everything was in the same, same package so florent already said started the idea that we could make a package that would be nice so that would be a nice contribution so he gave us the package for free for like collaboration and then we should make something out of it so Corentin and I started uh, working on that, and I decided that we should develop MS Noise as a package. And uh, we had the support from, from Grenoble, from Michel Campillo. He said that it was, was a good idea to make something that people can use. So again, this is 10 years ago. And then we did the first workshop at the Kagoshima Yafse uh, conference in 2013. That was tough, but we made it. And we have, since 2013, a lot of different documentation. We try to make uh, one release per year with new stuff that you can uh, input or things that I need. So often it's dictated by my needs, but I also listen to the community. And this is, this is what I want to convey here, is that you should report if you need some things and you can contribute things. This is important. And so since then, of course, the project has attracted a lot of PhD students, uh, interns, people who have contributed even just by asking a question. Asking a question to a developer is already providing a solution because if you ask a question, then I understand your need and I can make the package better. And so, as, although MS Noise is not funded, so I don't have a specific fund or specific time of my, uh, of my um, uh, agenda uh, every, every, every week to work on that, I, we still trying to maintain it. I have Corentin is, is doing a lot of debugging all the time. So he's, he's always using the latest version and then reporting that something doesn't work, but this is very helpful. And so you see that there's a lot of improvements since the last uh, five years also. Uh, and in 2020 now we will we'll have um, a new, um, new elements that I will show you in a minute, but I wanted to acknowledge all these people because some of them contributed just by attending workshops and asking questions, some contributed code. And this is very important when you do an open source project that everyone can contribute and benefit and also share ideas. This is an important thing. It's not a black box completely. Uh, it, is a, it is a big project, but it's not a black box. So what did I want to do? What did we want to do with this package? We wanted to have a software package that can measure velocity changes continuously on seismic data um, in a single language, because this single language is very important um, to, to be able to share easily the code to other people. And I chose Python for the basic reason that I was basically the, the only language I speak. No, for the real thing is that it's the only language in which I can make everything from handling a database, data files, seismic data, up to production of high quality figures that you can use in your papers. We wanted this project to be able to automatically find and search new data. We, I, I hate duplicating archives. We have archives, you acquire data at your institute, we want to work with that data. We don't want to, you to have to rewrite your data in another format to be able to read. I had, for example, Fortran code that can only read SAC. So I had to, to write SAC files from my mini seeds to be able to pass them, and then I have to convert back. This is not acceptable in, in 2020. It was not acceptable in 2010 already. Um, what I want to do also is that I want our systems to only process what is needed. Sometimes at the observatories or, or on laptop computers, you don't have such so much power, computing power. So we want to only process the new data, the modified data. So whenever you scan your archive, you will identify if there is new or a modified data. For example, you reacquire, um, um, relink to a station that was offline and you get one month of data. You don't have to do cross correlations or computing 
on all your stations of all your network for the last month. You only have to, to compute that station. And if you're doing cross correlation, you have to do it in the, with the pairs that connect to that station. But that's it. You don't have to reprocess everything. So be uh, kind of um, put economy on your, on your computing uh, expenditures. And uh, in the end, we want it for the original MS noise to be able to compute velocity variations every day because the goal of that project was to, mod to, to monitor volcanoes in the very early beginning, uh, actually to mimic what Florent Ringuier did on uh, Piton de la Fournaise, but in, in real time. And of course, have an API app application programming interface that you can connect to so that you can really interact with the code without really knowing what's what's what the Python is inside. But if you if you run a command like get results, you should get the results. And this needs to be documented, of course. So why Python? As I said, I talk only uh, Python. And also because since uh, no more than 10 years, OpSpy is the reference in, in um, open source uh, seismology framework, seismology pack package. Um, you can do basically any basic to advanced processing in OpSpy. Uh, OpSpy can certainly, and that is the key of also uh, my non-duplication of archives, that OpSpy is reading probably 15 or 20 formats now, seismic formats. Um, and for example, I wrote, uh, based on two uh, C codes, I wrote the, the reader for the win format, so the Datamark uh, win one format that, uh, that has been used quite a lot at your institute. Um, this, this format now can be read by OpSpy. So this is this is something that I wanted to build MS Noise on. So I, I see that I take OpSpy as as a as a brick to MS Noise. Then we have Pandas, which is a data data a frame, sorry, library uh, that you can handle really really efficiently data. And Pandas was not very very much known uh, before the onset of machine learning, but now everyone knows that Pandas is the best tool to pre-clean your data before trying to do machine learning, and also. These packages, SQL Alchemy, being able to interact with databases, Click is a command line interface, Flask is easy for web developments, and then in the end, DMS Noise is above all that. So includes all of these elements. And the magic is here, it runs on Windows, Mac, Linux, Sun, whatever, wherever you can run Python, you can run MS Noise. This is very important for me. So is it complicated to install? And I'm not going to give you a complete installation guide. You can follow, you can contact me, of course, anytime. You can join the chat. You can follow the guidelines on the documentation. I hope they are clear. If not, tell me. But is it, it's co as complicated, and that's a joke, it's simple. Con conda create minus n noise, minus c, conda forge, Python 3.7, an example, MS noise. For those who don't know conda, it's a virtual env environment um, manager and also a Python package manager, which is probably state of the art today. Create minus n noise, which just gives, create a virtual environment called noise and that will not mess with your system Python, for example. Conda Forge is a package repository where you have the latest versions of all packages. And that says that you want Python 3.7 and MS noise. And if you say that, Conda is going to search for all the dependencies of Python and MS Noise. Python is, is, the, is the runner and MS Noise has a list of dependencies. And if you do that, it is done. You have MS Noise ready on your computer. And again, it runs on all machines. So what about your data? Well, your data, if you can, and if you do it, and if you do it for the first time, you can start to, to, pre to prepare your data in organized folders. For example, an SDS archive, so SASCOM data structure, for example, if you run SaysComp, it is built in SaysComp, so you have your archive data in mini-seed format, single file per channel, per day, per station, per network, per year. If you don't, well, I accept, and we made MS Noise so that you can also run on any structure and scan any archive, any structure, any tree structure, and that's going to work as long as OpSpy can read the format. And there's a hell of a list of formats that OpSpy can read. Of course, for efficiency, sometimes it's better to have daily files than uh, win one minute or one second files. That is, that is a bit nasty. About the database, the best option would be the MySQL database because you can run fast, but then it also works with SQLite because we want to be able to run test cases on small data and without the, the hassle to install the database. And that's basically it. When you have done, you have your install of Python, you have your data in your database, you can start MS Noise. You can also run it on the HPC if you want. So there's documentation about that. You can develop on your laptop and then you can move everything to a high performance computing system 
And for example, I run the latest version of MS Noise on more than 2,000 cores here at the observatory. Uh, the only thing you need to do is to have MySQL that is able to handle so many connections, but for the rest, the code works very nicely. And I can help you if you want to do that. So the logic is you just based on the cron job. So for example, every hour or every day, you scan an archive, you find modified data, you do you define if there's new jobs and you process those jobs. You do correlations, you do moving window cross spectrum. In the end, you want to compute, for example, velocity variations, and then you do plots, which is an important thing. Everything interacts with an API and a database and archives. So this is your waveform archive and that would be your database and the database holds um, metadata and job scheduler. In the end, scan, jobs, CC, stack, moving window, cross spectrum, DP over T and DV over V, the velocity variation you want, for example, for a volcano, but you can also use it for different purposes. So where is this MS noise stuff? It's on GitHub. It has always been, it is licensed under the European public license uh, which is similar to an LGPL. So you can build your code on, on, on it and you cannot distribute it compiled, but you can link to it as a library. So it is very, very tolerant. And you, you can basically do whatever you want without any restriction. Um, this is this is uh, very the, the most op open version that we can have. Uh, you see that it is automatically tested. And I just saw when I did the screenshot that the build is failing now. So I have to correct that. The latest version of the package is 1.6.1, and you see that they have some, some nice stats in here. Uh, and the documentation is on msnoise.org slash doc. So this is just what I wanted to say about MS Noise. It's a 10-year project that we developed for in the beginning uh, to help Corentin doing his, his PhD. Also to be to be fair with Florent Bringuet, who gave us the code in the in the beginning. So we wanted also to have it run in real time at Piton de la Fournaise so that to replace Florent's project. Um, and then and then we opened it. And the reason for opening it is first because it's it's our our way to do it. So we want to do that. Um, it makes sense for us. This is the only way to do it. But also because sharing it and giving workshops about it made the project first move forward. Because I knew that when I have, whenever we do a workshop, I know I want the code to be perfect, or I use the workshop participants as a lab. Uh, helpers, so they, they debug with me for, for two days and then we have something much better and then, and everyone is part of the, of the release next to it. But then for sure, having regular workshops, trainings, spread the word that it is, it's not complicated to reproduce what Florent Branguier did in 2008 in his papers. We can do it with MS Noise and anyone with seismology background can do it now because there is a software package that we built to help you doing it. So these examples that I'm going to show here, have all been done with MS Noise by different people through time, at least for pro parte or completely with MS Noise. Um, that people have contacted us, followed the workshops, or completely independently read the documentation, installed the code, and, and have some good results. So the first result I want to show you is that it, this is the the, the, way, the one I computed on the 2000 core machine. This is 30 years of seismic data, and what MS Noise does by the, the basic product of MS Noise is scanning your archive and computing cross correlation functions that you see here on the upper right. These are cross correlation fun functions per day on for 30 years. And so those 30 years of data, then I use that as a um, um, to, to study here between the, um, the dashed lines, the, the coda of the cross correlation functions. And this coda, you can turn that into velocity variation because if your wave comes slower, so longer time uh, lag, then it means that the waves have traveled slower between your stations or at least in the um, in the zone where these waves have traveled for, for such a coda of correlation. And so what we could do here was to show that there is a change in the behavior of the aquifer and also of the surface temperature in this is, this is south uh, East Germany in, in Bavaria. So this is uh, the Grefenberg Mountains and uh, the, um, sorry, the Grefenberg array in, in, uh, in the mountains close to Nuremberg. What we wanted to see here is that you see the velocity change that we have been evidencing is like 10 to the minus four, which is very small. Uh, of course, for volcano monitoring, your signals are much bigger and we're gonna see that in a second. This is another, um, uh, so you see here the title here, monitoring the crust and aquifers, because of course there's no volcano in that area. Another example is that zone here, doesn't speak to you, but if I tell you that is Los Angeles basin, then you see uh, immediately the interest of having an idea of what the velocity variation look like. And you see that the blue line here would be the groundwater level and the black line would be the velocity variation. And there is a proxy between the two, 
you can relate velocity variations on a, on a weekly to monthly basis, and even though we know that shorter works um, to groundwater levels. So using seismic noise, you sample the earth, and if your waves travel faster or slower, you can say if there is a change in, in, the, um, in, the, um, in the properties of the crust, and those properties can be saturation. This has been shown also by Sensenfelder in, in Indonesia in 2006, and actually was the first one of the first diversity variations that you can uh, that was uh, identified and was not a volcanic setting. It, well, it was a volcanic setting, but it was not a volcanic result. It was linked to seasonal changes, probably of uh, groundwater of water content in the crust in the upper crust. Very very shallow in the end upper crust. So we have been also working with uh, with Rafael Duplan on, on the Etna volcano, for example, and this is a case that was. Actually, we were um, working with Raphael Duplan. He was doing his PhD at the University of Luxembourg. And the idea here was to reproduce cases that are most common in the world. So we were working on Etna volcano in this case, or on, on Piton de la Fournaise volcano in that case. Piton de la Fournaise or Etna are super heavily instrumented. But then for the PhD of, of Raphael, we decided to take only three stations, which is more representative of what happens, for example, in Indonesia, but also in a lot of countries in the world where for a long time, at least maybe today, we have more instruments per volcano, but for a, for a long, long period of time, because of mostly the difficulty to install uh, in, uh, and maintain instruments, you only have one instrument at some location or two instruments. So the PhD of Rafael was dedicated to what can we do in velocity variation, so using MS nose, but for single station monitoring. What if you have only one station? And the results you see here on the top right shows that, the, for example, if you look at the red curve, this is the station FOR, this is this station, and you see that you go from a basically flat line down to minus 0.2%, then you go back up, and then you have a strong drop before here in red, this big uh, eruption of 2014. Uh, big was one day eruption, and there was uh, Jeff Yusuf, of course, in Piton de la Fournaise, but there was an eruption. This drop here follows heavy rainfall, this drop here follows, uh, this drop here, sorry, precedes uh, the, the red line, so precedes the eruption. And this, this is what we want to achieve in volcano monitoring. We want to have precursors. And so Raphael's PhD was on the, on, the, on the Fournaise and on the Etna, and both of them you can see changes and that you can use uh, single stations to do that. Um, Claire Donaldson worked with, with uh, the people in Cambridge and Corentin also, Caudron, um, on monitoring Hawaii, uh, Kilauea volcano in Hawaii, USA. And in the, this is not the result of the velocity variation. This is the results of the interpretation they could make out of it. And they, they, they understood the difference when the lake, the lava lake was high, close to the surface, or when the pressure source was more at depth, there is a change in the Coulomb stress, and then there is a change in the velocity variations. And so using noise, you can also have observables that you didn't have before because maybe your GPS data is too weak. There is no signal enough that you can interpret the pressure sources, but then you can also, you can do it with seismic waves because they sample the Earth also for quite a long time. So there is a lot of accumulation of delays. Aurelien Mordre did that on ice sheets. It is a little less of interest for Indonesia, I think. Well, we never know. Um, but then yeah, the velocity variations are also linked to pressure uh, that, that uh, of the ice on the crust. And then you see that at up to certain depths, uh, they could model that the change of pressure at the surface changes the behavior of uh, the cracks and the water content of the crust. And so seismic wave will respond to that. Uh, seismic wave velocity, let's say, will, will respond to that. And you can monitor that. And so he was monitoring um, the fringe of outlet glaciers of, of Greenland um, with icing and de-icing and, and accumulation of snow and ice and see that the surface pressure actually was fast changing. And so you can, can turn velocity variations into a mass balance of ice, for example. Um, Esteban Chavez in, uh, in, uh, in Costa Rica showed that you have also, um, so was looking for precursory signs of earthquakes in the velocity variations that is so probably, so mostly um, post seismic uh, changes and that you can relate, for example, with the, the GPS data that also have the post seismic relaxation. So one of the, of the grails today to follow and to people are doing a lot of research on that is to find precursory signs of buildup of pressure along fault zones and that you could, could identify with this method. Uh, for the moment, it hasn't been shown. 
uh, there is a lot of developments also not only in surface wave monitoring but also with body waves and that could lead also to better results because body wave sample is deeper and also more uh, the, the kernel is, is more uh, densely located at depths contrary to surface wave kernels could just take the average of the earth so here we have an example of a magnitude 7.6 uh, and then you see that here is a big change but what what esteban could do with this paper um, was to pinpoint the pressurization at different depths and that is an important thing also with seismic noise they are sensitive to depths there's kind of broad broad uh, kernels but you can you can use uh, those kernels uh, to to invert for depths and you can uh, have an, an idea of the different pressurization at different depths gerrit olivier and, and his collaborators did a, a, a fantastic study of a tailing dam so it's a gravity dam uh, in uh, tasmania and you see that this velocity here changes were strong uh, at some locations where uh, there was seepage uh, through the through the dam so there was a failure of a dam beginning of a failure and then using seismic waves that in slowed down by the water content in the dam they could they could have uh, pinpoint places where there were um, probably failures or, or seepage through the dam so this is this can also be uh, important for 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 cases uh, where where you have structures to monitor i mean this this method is is fantastic because it works on so many different um, areas. So um, there's there's been examples on, on people working on landslides, for example. Also, this is also a topic that at least CVGHM is, is, is very interested in. And equipping landslides, uh, the team in Grenoble and, and others now uh, more recently have, have been showing that there's there's a lot of effort, for example, at the BGS in the UK um, to to super equip some very uh, fast moving landslides and see whether they can they can really pinpoint the time when the landslide starts to move in the conditions in which uh, which are needed to, to, to make the landslide move, for example, the saturation of groundwater on the, on the plane uh, beneath the landslide. So these elements can, can be achieved with seismic instruments. And the advantage of that is that you can put seismic instruments on um, a single instrument now on the landslide, for example, and you should have data that you can analyze. And what we wanted to have with MS Noise is that whenever you guys have one data, one day, a few weeks, you want to test the method, you can do it because in the five line and two hours, you have a result with MS Noise that you can start to look at or interact with people who know uh, the technique, uh, ask the mailing list for us, and then we can also help um, because this is easy to test. So you don't have to send us the data, you can do it yourself, you can build your experience with it and you can make uh, a product out of it, something that you can really use in your daily work. So MS Noise is not only based on the velocity variations, it also has been used as a framework, so really kind of a, a essential tool or brick in another workflow. And this is an example from Zach Spica in, 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 um, in Mexico and the USA, southern USA. So he used MS Noise to compute these cross correlation functions. And you see that here they are sorted by distance. And you can see that the Rayleigh wave here would travel very uh, slowly, three, uh, something like three kilometers per second. But then so sometimes there's some differences and you have different, uh, but you see that for 2000 kilometers, you could pick the Rayleigh wave. Uh, so on, all, along all these rays here. And so you see these uh, velocity maps and, and that, that, is, that helped uh, Zach to, to interpret uh, some, some depth to, um, to mantle uh, structures, uh, crustal to mantle structures uh, beneath, beneath Mexico and the southern US. This is another example, more shallow um, in the folk in the Faroe Islands from from um, San Marco. Um, he did the um, he used MS noise for computing the cross correlation functions, but then inverted with another software, and you see that he could do some maps of very very shallow crust and also cross sections, which is very interesting for understanding the structure of of these these um, these islands. This is a paper we, we published with um, a note uh, in South Africa. So this is a Karoo Car basin. Uh, and there is a, a very strong contrast of velocities. You see here the fast velocities and in red, the low, slow velocities. And this was part of a development of, of a package, uh, like a broader package, uh, sister package to MS Noise called MS Noise Tomo that help you do basic surface wave uh, tomography, at least maps of, of velocity maps like that and invert for depths. That is another package, but you can, you can have an idea of, again, we wanted to have some code that you can run 
and get your idea of do I have something in my data? And without having to build a big European or a, a world project with people and send data and this, you can do it yourself. And this is this is what we want to to show, and that's what we what we did during workshops too. Corentin did uh, another another work with so using MS Noise just as a um, archive scanner and job definer. So we, as soon as there are the jobs, then you just compute well, just compute you compute. Um, the ratio of amplitude, so the seismic amplitude ratio, but between two stations. And if you have two stations and the ratio changes, it means that your source is migrating towards one of your stations. So if it gets higher at A and lower at B, your ratio increased, A to B increases. So it means that your source is getting closer to A. And so if you do that for the whole network, then you can see that you can pinpoint somehow the source of micro seismicity without having to pick any phase, without to have to measure anything. You just have a completely automatic method to see there is migration. And in this case, it was the migration along the dike of the Bardar Bunga Horuran eruption in 2014. And you see this, this is the distance along strike. And you see that the location where, the red location is the location where the methods called SARA, so seismic amplitude ratio analysis, uh, predicts your source to be just based on the blue network. Of course, this is a very dense network and it's kind of nice geometry, but it works. So what also is, has been uh, merged into MS Noise recently was a plugin. I know it's it's part of the of the main repository. Um, you are able with MS Noise to compute your spectrograms. So spectrograms is easy to make for two to through five minutes data. It's done by default by, for example, Earthworm. Uh, it is done in uh, Vortex, for example, also. But maybe you want to, to have your own spectrogram based on years of data. And, and to do that, my way would, has been to split the original data in chunks, in hours, for example, and compute the power spectral density, so PSD. Very, very uh, nervous one, so not smooth, not as smooth as PQLX, because PQLX is too smooth for uh, most of our applications. You cannot see, for example, this fine information if you take the standard PQLX uh, smoothing parameters. And so you do that every hour, you run on your data, you do, you store. And then you have a plotter that can load a year of data because you only have one spectrum per hour and that is cheap to run. And so you can play with the colors, you can play with the data, you can zoom in, you can extract information. So this is coming to my the second part and it's a shorter part of my presentation. Um, so recently we've been trying to use seismic noise, also just the spectrograms. Because if you look at it, we said there is this oceanic band and then the more anthropogenic band, we know they are, they have, we have elements there that are um, showing different uh, contributions to the noise field. And so what we want to do here is to extract information at specific frequencies and look if they look alike, if they, we can interpret something from the noise. So using these spectrograms, you can see here, for example, a an amplitude of the seismic noise between 5 and 20 hertz for all the Belgian stations uh, since 2017 until uh, January 2020. You see that some stations pop out and they are really energetic. So you see the yellow colors are the high level. And these are the stations that are the most um, surface stations. So they're really, really at the surface. Others are also there, but they also either very close to industry or within cities. For example, UCCS is the seismic station at the surface in the, the building behind me on the picture here. And I will show you later. Um, in the center, I mean, it's not center, but it is in Brussels and, and it was the suburbs, but it's now it's in the city. So what we want to do is to extract this information, which in the end is a table. We do some nice Python 10 line of code, and then we have a Monday to Sunday and zero hour to 23 hour data. What, gives, what it gives us is that we have the time of the day as a clock plot. So this is a 24 hour clock. And we have in color the data, the, the noise level during the, the median noise level for three years of that station um, per day. So per day and then per hour. So what you see here is that in the morning around six, five to six uh, local time, we have a sharp increase of the noise in Brussels that goes up to eight. So this is the start of the peak hour up to eight. And then it's busy, 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 busy until seven. And then it does start to drop and it's quieter at midnight. You also see that the blue and green, which are Saturday and Sunday early mornings 
are more busy than the other days of the weeks, the week, sorry. Uh, and this is because it's, I mean, Saturday morning and Sunday morning, you can also call that Friday evening and Saturday evening night. So people go out, go to restaurants, go to parties, and then they take their car, they take the public transport, and they go back home. And so you have more energy here around two and three and four o'clock in the morning. It seems that people sleep, most of them of them sleep between four and five every day of the week. So with that data, you can, you can start to understand what is the field, what is your data. You can also um, understand if you need to, to for example, your, your catalog of seismic activity, and you see that you have more events between zero and six in the morning than during from eight to 10 in the evening. About well, eight in the morning to 10 in the, in, in the evening. And that is also called the network detectability. So you might lose seismic events if your station has the same profile as my station here, because your station might just be too noisy to pick up small events. And maybe all your events are in this quadrant, and then you don't have other events, but it's not linked to the sun or the moon, it's linked to humans making too much noise. So last part, um, how did we see the COVID-19 uh, pandemic on the noise data here in Brussels? Uh, well, the first thing, and uh, I'm not completely sure how the lockdown worked uh, in the different cities of where you are, guys. Um, uh, but here in Brussels, for those who have been here, this is the uh, Rue de la Loi, which is one of the busiest streets entering Brussels in the morning. And this is on the right what it looked like during uh, March 2020. So there was basically no one. In Brussels, it was absolutely quiet, and you mean you can hear it is quiet. And the reason for that is what that um, non-essential workers were asked to stay home, telework, or stay home at least, uh, and do essential shopping only once a week, and try to go alone, and then in, in a very very short radius around your home. So you shouldn't take your car to go to the city. So this is commuting. This is not commuting. There is no one. So what it looks like on the spectrogram is that you have the night here; it's quiet. And then you have the daytime when it looked like that. And here, this is 25th March, during the, the strict, strictest uh, lockdown measures in Brussels. You see it's quiet, then it's more busy, but not as busy as here. And that was during, I mean, during lockdown, so after the lockdown date. So the station of uh, Uccle is located here in the basement of that little building here, where actually uh, Devi Chabana finished his PhD, uh, and we were sharing this office with four PhD students and many, many, many visitors. So this is the pavilion of seismology. This has been built in 1908 uh, by Solvay. He's also known in Indonesia for, uh, for his chemical work. And so you see that these instruments, some of them are still there. And so here, this little red dot is actually this Puralp seismometer that we keep at the surface. We know it's not a good one, but we keep it for a continuity and comparison methods, uh, comparing, sorry, a, the, the true uh, ground motion in Brussels with the respect with the historical instruments, but in of course in, in Brussels we also have a borehole that is much better and that we knew we can use for seismic monitoring. So this station here at the surface in the pavillon uh, recorded the, uh, the the data that I'm showing now. So you see normal weeks. So this is Christmas. You see that it's quiet in Christmas. Um, I mean uh, Belgium is a, is a, a, a of a Christian tradition, so usually Christmas is also holidays here. Um, you have the weeks here, and you see in, in orange that I took the average of normal weeks, and you see that after the strictest lockdown on 18 March, we have a drop of seismic noise by 33%. We also have the, 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 the most quietest nights ever uh, recorded during that period, because there is no reason to go that night, because there were no restaurants, and even when they, some, something could open, they couldn't open until 10 in the evening and not further. So this was, this was a very nice time to uh, listen to birds in Brussels. People discovered there are birds in their garden, for example, because there's just so much less noise. I showed you the 24-hour plot uh, of Uccle, so, the, so the, for the color is a bit different here. So Saturday, Sunday morning, you see it's here, but the rest of the weeks is like kind of normal before lockdown was looking like that. And during the lockdown, so after lockdown date, you see that all of the noise just dropped by 30 to 30%. So they basically go to the weekend level. So uh, what happened during that period is that uh, we were home. So since uh, March uh, 17 or 15, I was home and I'm working with noise. So I said, okay, let's, let's, let's show our people, let's show our fellow citizens, and in the beginning, my family, uh, that there is, um, there is a change if we all do small changes. We received uh, the, the instructions from the government to stay home. It was not nice. And we all had the impression of being the only one being home and the others being outside. 
But then I wanted to show this bigger picture on the on the left, showing that you have a drop. And so you see, you see that the, the first lockdown was 15 and the second uh, measure was on 18. And you can already see that even after the weekend, it was going down. And I shared this information on Twitter saying that this, the earth continues shaking and we are teleworking and the grown movement of human activity drop. It, mean, it means that it looks like the measures taken by the government is resp are respected and that people stay home and stay healthy and safe. And so I also immediately shared the data and the uh, code on GitHub because I, I wanted to, I mean, let people do uh, their own computation. And so some people immediately participated uh, and, and shared the information and started to process their own data. This information went, well, it's a bad word, viral. So it went on the internet, it went very, very popular. Um, it was shared by Gizmodo and then lots of press releases because we actually brought something new that was not as dramatic as the pandemic itself. And I don't want to, 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 to minimize the, the importance of, of the pandemic, be, be understandably well, but we, we brought something different. We brought an observation, uh, kind of a message of hope for the people. We all have something to do. And if you all do it together, it works. And this is visible in the seismic data. It was visible also in the atmospheric data, in the pollution data. People have seen that. And so that is the message we wanted to convey. And well, the community took over. So Kuhn here, a fellow uh, a colleague here at the observatory, um, he, he asked, okay, uh, no, uh, with Thomas, we structured the information and we composed a Google form for whoever wants to contribute to, uh, to, to the data. And we want to co call that social seismology. We want to, to share uh, information. Actually that tweet followed the first one I did on the 1st of April and you might know that uh, on 1st of April, people to do, tend to do jokes, and people who know me know that I love jokes. And I shared on the 1st of April a, a tweet, but it was a very serious one. I actually didn't know we were on the 1st of April. And I said, what if we just join forces all over the world, process data, and make a common paper, common publication on the social seismology? What we are seeing today on the data that we process every day, but now we use the same code, the same technique, and we all do that together. And Kuhn, brought uh, the form together and we immediately had more than 100 people start to interact uh, and, and share information, share data. And this is an example, for example, for example from Mark Van Stone. He's a secondary school teacher in the UK and he composed with the code we shared, he composed kind of a poster to the, for the pupils and for the information in the UK about the decrease of seismic noise with, to the pandemic. This was only possible because we shared the code and we shared the information. Frédéric Massin works at the ETH in Zurich in Switzerland, and he actually modified the code so that people can use Raspberry Shakes with the data. So it is the code. So in the end, it works. We started a Slack channel. We are 100 people, and today we are at 12,000 messages exchanged uh, in 11 time zones, which is fantastic. And the last part of this magic is that because we had all these people joining forces, analyzing data, interacting in the writing of a paper, we were able to, to publish that study with 76 orders, 66 institutions from, I think, 26 or 27 different countries, but with stations from all over the world. You see the map at the bottom here, where we have identified or not lockdowns, uh, lockdown measures and effect on seismic data. And what you see on the right is a world uh, city map, well, not city map, but city uh, data. And the, you see it's sorted by the little white dot here, that would be your lockdown date. So the, the day that the strictest lockdown has been enforced. Um, and the energy color of each line corresponds to the noise level at high frequency of that specific city. For example, the first one would be Taipei and then Anxi and then uh, Nemengu. Um, and the darker color, of course, corresponds to a low amplitude. So we normalize the amplitude by uh, before lockdown, so we know that the, from weekend to uh, to mo Monday midday, that would be the maximum minimum minimum you can have, and so you you sort your data like that. You see that most of the world has still a quiet Christmas New Year period. You see the weekends, so these are the dark bands here, and then you see that after lockdown, uh, the whole planet went quieter in high frequency noise, and this is this is a study that we could not only do because we. Each of the individuals here in this list processed the data in the same way, using the same code, provided data, and then interacted to generate this information. And I think this is a, 
this is a proof um, that this community, um, and this, in, in this case here, it's seismological community, but I mean the community of, of humans sharing information and knowledge. So did that, that is the community I'm talking about. It's not seismologists. I'm talking about no people who are sharing. When people share, when people open, then you can achieve something as crazy as that adventure that we've lived. We started that on the 1st of April and that was published before end of July. This is the most overwhelming experience we, I have had and I, I know from a lot of, of those people, uh, my, my co-authors, let's call them, we call that the, uh, the, the 76 now. Um, this has been an overwhelming experience and, and, and this is what, what, I mean, the paper is nice, I love it of course, but the adventure behind it is even more, this is what I want to share, is that we can do that. And we stayed home and make my own local noise lower, but I also stayed home and worked. I was very lucky. I'm full health. Everyone is safe. I can work. I can share. And we make something really great out of it. So um, the, only, the last thing I want to say here is that this paper, I, 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 I invite you to read it. And please read the last line of the acknowledgements because the most important thing for us was that we dedicate this article and this work to all the essential workers who have kept our countries running and, and going forward during the pandemic. Thank you very much for your attention. Um, and please read the last part. I will not read them for you. This is exactly what I want to convey here. We can all make changes. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Thomas, for the very, very interesting uh, talk and inspiring as well. So uh, the last part of your presentation are uh, something that uh, we will not do maybe in uh, next 100 years unless we have the same conditions like this. Yeah. So this is a very particular uh, condition. So uh, we, we are now in the question and answers uh, session. We have some already some questions. I will read it uh, for Toma. So um, the first question is uh, about the data. Uh, you showed uh, so many uh, results of, 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 of your analysis. And uh, there's, uh, there's a question about the minimum data required to be uh, to be able uh, to be computed in, in MS noise, uh, the, the requirement. Uh, what what is the requirement of, of this data, and uh, and also about the duration of the data? Of course, it's related on on, on, on your goal. But could you ex uh, could you explain about that? Mm -hmm. Sure. So, yeah. so the, the um, it depends of, of your target, of course. Um, but it works with one channel of one sensor, so you can work with. Uh, a single station, so to, um, single vertical station uh, that, for example, you, you have uh, on some volcanoes uh, in, in Indonesia, you would have a single vertical channel station at uh, the punchak of every volcano. So you can use that um, as, as long as you, you have some continuity. So you should um, not have a gap every 12 seconds, that will not work. But if, even if you have only 12 hours per day for a few months, for example, you can use it. This is um, this is the beauty of this cross correlation method is that as soon as you have blocks of data that are like a few minutes long, you can already start to have an, an idea of what your, your medium has, has recorded. The cross correlation in the end is an enhancer of coherent information. So if you do auto correlation of a, of, on a sensor, you can also use that. And that's what Raphael showed for, for Piton La Fournette. So, of course, the more station is better, but sometimes you get overwhelmed by too many stations and you lose the information because also you dilute the information. And in the end, of course, lab volcanoes, very, very nice, effusive, Etna, Piton La Fournaise, uh, Hawaii. We now know it works very, very well there. Corentin is busy with, with, for example, with you and others to, to work on wet volcanoes. And half, at least, if not more, of your Indonesian volcanoes are very, very active hydrothermal systems. And this is challenging because, of course, the dynamic is fast. And so you need to have kind of very, for example, high rate um, uh, seismic sensors. Not, not, I mean, not high rate, but um, let's say 100 hertz data and of very good quality 
uh, and for a long time. So you need the baseline. So sometimes you can work with few days, for example, on the landslide, but you should have a month before to know if your signal is just linked to one single rainfall or if it's if it's if it's complete. Is as always, you can take. I mean, if you think about I'm, my background is is quantitative seismology. Quantitative seismology. If you look at your, you put a sensor somewhere and you count the number of earthquakes and you say, oh, this is a very active fault, but maybe it has been a very active for 100 years. We don't know that. So that's a problem of completeness. In velocity variations, you need the same thing. You need to have a background. So you need to define your zero and then look at the information. So I would say for a specific volcano, for example, you would need a few months of data before something happens. Definitely a, a very strong, um, I think, task that that CVGHM, for example, has, has, has started is to convert to back convert archives to to a common format. And, and this is this is an essential milestone to to process those data in a very, very uh, systematic fashion so that you can learn from that. Not hearing you, David. You're muted, Dave. I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, so thank you for your uh, answers and uh, related with, with your uh, answers, uh, there is another question asking about the type of the seismometers that, uh, yeah, maybe you have some preferences on, 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 on this works uh, uh, because you, you mentioned about the, uh, the uh, raspberry shake because mm -hmm. and, and uh, there's of course some limitations and can you give uh, an information about the seismometers the broadband the short periods and things like that and how it will it apply uh, in in your uh, ms noise so what in the beginning we we worked with the the broadband data from piton de la fournaise because there was the the same network as florent bringuet used and that works very nice the reason why is that we by default, use the most energetic part of the uh, noise spectrum, which is between one and 10 seconds. That's a secondary macro seism. So of course, if you have a sensor that is not sensitive in that area, you, you can be in trouble. But then the, the, the spectrogram I showed you is from a seismic node. So it is a 4.5 Hertz geophone with maximum amplification. Okay, that's 36 dB uh, amplification, but this is just a node. So the maximum, sensitivity of that is around 2000 volts per meters per second, which is the very, very, very low amplitude that you can have with a professional seismometer. So in the end, it works with many different instruments. It works for sure with short period instruments. Um, all you need to do is to, to do this, these spectrograms and look at the stability of your noise, stability of your record. If your sensor is bad, understand me, is as low uh, uh, response in the frequency band that you're interested in, but if it's consistently bad, so it is always the same, then you can use it for interpreting. So this is, this is the, 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 um, the magic of that is that even though you might not be able to pick a teleseismic event on your short period or whatever you call it, but with the cross correlation, you can enhance information. And, and because we're stacking things, so maybe you will not be able to have a lower resolution, but when you do correlations for half hours and then you stack them over a day, then you reduce, you, you, you increase the signal to noise ratio and then you have more information. So of course, broadbands can be interesting, but for most of the applications, I would prefer a very good one, one second instrument, uh, like for example, the, um, uh, the Lennart's one seconds. Uh, they have a very, very nice uh, response down to probably five, seven seconds. Um, and they, they are very consistent one to the other. With a proper acquisition, that would be much cheaper than a broadband and you can do a lot of things. Of course, when you equip a volcano, you want to have also all the LPs and everything and maybe the one second is not enough. That's, that's another story. But from the noise point of view, you can afford to have a bit cheaper instruments than very, very broadbands. And also what, what is um, important is if, even if you have a one second instrument, you should try to to put it in a vault and all these good instruments uh, installations that you would do for a broadband, but it's good for noise that you put it away from wind, uh, like a low, low rise little buildings and stuff like that. Okay, thank you, Tom, for, for the uh, answers. And uh, we still have some questions. Uh, yeah, about the, 
the visualizations that you showed it's it's uh, for some people it's uh, maybe new because uh, you have very beautiful uh, graphs and and uh, and what tools that you use uh, in, in 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 this uh, in this uh, case yeah yeah. So, case, yeah so most of them because except the ones that i haven't i mean it's not my publications but some most of them are i python based so it's mostly uh, Matplotlib and Seaborn. Um, the 3D visualizations are made in uh, VTK or um, and so opened in the uh, Mayavi package. So it's a three dimensional uh, visualization package. Uh, but so with MS Noise, everything is based on Matplotlib. Um, and and every anytime, so and yeah, so either built in in OpSpy or MS Noise or in Matplotlib, and and all the codes are there to to plot. Uh, the only thing that uh, are not yet completely um, fully supported, I mean, there's there's issues, of course, all the time because package evolve and I, it needs to be to be maintained. The mapping is done with Cartopy, which is very nice, powerful tool. There's been, uh, um, I think, a student in the UK is trying to make that compatible with PyGMT now, so the the new bindings to GMT, um, but in Python. Um, yeah, so these these are the main tools we use, and then we use uh, QGIS. Uh, QGIS for um, the mapping. Okay. So uh, you see that what, what I said is just open source only. Yeah, I, I think you showed uh, every uh, every single slide on, on your presentations are made of open source uh, software. Uh, there, <laughs> so. there, might, there might be some publication in MATLAB, but I, I don't, okay. tell <laughs> don't, don't tell people. Yeah, but I, yeah, I know you don't like MATLAB. <laughs> Okay, Tom. So, um, there's a, another question uh, also uh, about uh, the uh, the this method. I mean, the MS noise method. Uh, can we detect a stress field around the volcano? I mean, for volcanic uh, activity monitoring or along area of the subduction zones uh, to monitor seismicity leading to maybe an earthquake. Is there any potential uh, that such research may be uh, developed uh, to to be able to do that. Yeah, so for the volcano part, this is like somehow what, what Claude Nelson and the team in Cambridge have done on, on, on Hawaii. And I show you these two, two different blobs of the Coulomb stress field. Um, somehow they, they modeled that from the, the, the velocity variation data. So um, if your if velocity is increased on one location and decrease on another one, it means that you have a different behavior of your stress field. So you kind of map the stress field. Um, but that of course is, to my knowledge, has never been done in real time. This is done like three years after the eruption. So of course, the challenge that we have here is to have um, understanding of what's happening today and predict an eruption tomorrow and not predict an eruption four years ago. Because this is not uh, real time monitoring. This is not monitoring. This is forensic monitoring. And we don't want to do that. That's, so this is, this is one thing. But I think it, it could be done, at least at the surface, for very shallow systems like uh, Kilauea, probably for um, wet volcanoes also, because your hydrothermal system has a very, very fast response. And our hope is to be a little faster than the GPS. So a little faster than the formation so that you would have at least one red flag would be the, the, the velocity variations transferred, co converted to stress. The other flag would be the GPS. And then you have information in your operation room that you know there is something uh, at the observatory. You, need, you know what is what's happening. For the subduction zones, the issue is that it's the depth. So depth is always an issue for, for surface waves. So using body waves, there could be a way, uh, but then you can also use um, the continuous data. So not MS noise for the velocity variation, but MS noise as a um, job scheduler for, for running specific codes. You might have heard of EQ core scan. EQ core, core scan is a Python package by Calum Chamberlain in, the, in New Zealand. And it allows you to define templates of events and then search for these events on continuous data. So it's kind of uh, yeah cross correlation of events template matcher, and you can you can start to to detect events and that might maybe give you more information uh, together for example with Sarah so the amplitude ratios and see that you have more micro seismicity at one location without specifically being able to locate it. So that could work, uh, but definitely it's more challenging and also due to the the station uh, repartition above the subduction zones. Uh, there's not an OBS every 10 kilometer. Uh, there are a lot of seismic stations in Indonesia. 
uh, if you if you join the seismic network of the CVGHN, the BM Carrier, you have a lot of stations. But of course, at, at sea, above the trench, there's not so many. And that is an issue for locating, for sure. Thank you, Tom. Uh, just uh, have more questions uh, related to the questions from uh, yeah, the previous one. Uh, have you ever worked with, with the OBS data and uh, the noise with, uh, I mean, the noise uh, cross correlations using the OBS data for for any uh, applications? And how, how can you share with us uh, what how's the result? So, so I, I, I just did a basic uh, processing of some, some uh, OBS, uh, OBL, that was the bottom of a lake, uh, of uh, Lake Yellowstone. Um, I did just, I mean, it works. You have cross correlation functions. Uh, the issue is that your uh, contrast between water and, and crust is not the same as crust and air. So of course, your, the energy is different. You have shoulder waves, you have uh, trapped waves in, in, in different layers. So this is more tricky, but people are doing it. Um, there, are, there are experiments in progress for doing um, ambient noise-based tomography using the, um, the OBSs. Uh, I think there's a lot of, of work done also in, the, uh, in Ireland in the team of um, Chris Bean. Uh, they, are, they are conducting, they, they, are just, I just, they just picked up the instruments recently from the Irish seas and then the, uh, around uh, the Atlantic Ocean. Um, so yeah, it's possible, it works. Uh, of course, there's, 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 it's a different uh, physical context, but uh, correlation uh, is, is working. Uh, one, one, uh, one thing it needs to be done with uh, OBSs, and as, I mean, as always with OBSs like boreholes, you need to orient them properly. And for example, just just that little task can be can be uh, you you can use MS noise for doing that because if you cross correlate the one and two components of your OBS um, together, then you have a relative angle between them. So you can define you can identify the rotation between instruments. As soon as you have one reference instrument, you can rotate all of the others uh, to with with the cross correlation function. Actually, this is the same way you would. Uh, find the orientation of the one and two components of a borehole when you put a sensor at the surface. You would correlate the the uh, the, uh, or, the horizontal components together until the moment you and, and 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 rotate until the moment they align and the correlation are the same. So for that, it could work. Um, and yeah, I mean timing is always an issue in in OBSs. It could have, it could be an issue. And using cross correlation functions, so the basic product of MS noise, you scan your archive, you compute the correlation, you have a daily value, and then you plot that as a spectrogram or a correlogram. And just looking at that, you can see if there is a clock drift. Because if the correlation um, between two stations shifts in time, so your zero lag shifts, it means that one of the two has a clock issue. It's not a velocity variation. So just for that already, it's a good tool. Yeah, uh, it's it's a short question. Have you seen the uh, data, OBS data from the Mayotte? Uh, uh, no, not yet. Okay. No, I, I haven't. Okay. I haven't. I mean, you know, you know. So these there there are some people who have not do not share exactly my vision of. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Okay, but uh, yeah, that will be uh, interesting because uh, here in Indonesia we have also some some some. Uh, submarine volcanoes and and we are uh thinking of how to monitor these and and thinking of how using the ms noise as well to to as a tool to monitor the activity okay let's go back to the other questions uh for the application of ms noise is it uh possible to for example uh, there's a question uh to forecast the atmospheric event uh, such as when a typhoon is coming or where the direction or at least where the direction it will grow uh, have is there any uh, application of this uh, yeah of this ms noise for this kind of application yes um so i haven't done it but and, and people haven't done it with ms noise but actually the technique is exactly the same and they coded their own code but uh the, the team of um the null and uh no sorry um luce gualtieri uh, did did this uh, to track storms, so you can use worldwide seismic stations or your local network and and identify uh, pressure sources in the ocean. Actually, you're identifying the source of uh, Rayleigh waves, so you can invert for the source, you can pinpoint to the source, uh, and then track that. The other thing you can also do is to, just to look at the, the spectrograms uh, of your data because you see that your waves are coming towards or away from you. 
uh, just by 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 looking at the way the um, individual station respond to the to the seismic noise. So, we, for example, we know that in the Southern North Sea here in in Belgium, so the this is the sea between the Netherlands and the UK. Um, that when there is a storm passing uh, above Scotland and then going down in the North Sea, it pushes water in front of it, and we are at risk for storm storm, storm surges. Sorry. Uh, because we are lowlands. I mean, as 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 uh, most of the coast of Indonesia, there is not a, a cliff of, of 100 meters high. It's a, like a small narrow beach and a very very thin angle. And and so of course, whenever we have these storm surges, you can you can see them coming on seismic data. Of course, today with weather data, with weather satellites, we have a better better uh, information about it. But we recently concluded a study where we digitized uh, 1953 paper records. And these uh, paper records, we turn them into spectrums, and we can use those spectra sorry, as uh, a proxy for the sea state. And so we can track back um, storms in the past in the uh, in the in the ocean, and we can also identify if the of the storms of today take the same path, or if the at, uh, the Atlantic Ocean has changed. So for for that, you can also go back to your paper records, scan them, and have some big fun because uh, we uh, there's this uh, it's it's. It's a nightmare to do. Oh, it's nice. Uh, TIFF images for one terabyte, but you can do that with Python. Yeah, it's um, yeah. So your your newest uh, publication that's uh, very interesting to to transform the the analog records to a digital one. And uh, can you give a, a glimpse of of, of these uh, publications uh, that that you do, so that people can, uh, uh, for example. Uh, have an idea of, of, of how you, you work on this uh, to... Yeah, can I just show you um, yeah, the, sure. the, the PDF? Wait just a second and open mm -hmm. it. So uh, for the participants, Toma, uh, we recently published an article uh, and uh, to, to digitize the, the analog records on papers into uh, digital formats. And, and, and then uh, he analyzed that data and resulted in a very interesting uh, result. And uh, Toma will share a little bit about, uh, about his uh, new publication. Have you found it? Tom, uh, no, just one second, but maybe you can ask me another question. Okay, okay, I, I will ask uh, another question. There's a question from, uh, I, uh, Agus is, is uh, the chief of uh, Merapi section. He asked uh, about, uh, so uh, at Merapi, uh, we have uh, more than 20 broadband uh, se seismometer stations, mm -hmm. so, but the results of the hypocenters are not stable. So this is probably because uh, we are using the homogeneous uh, seismic velocity model, mm -hmm. which is not uh, representative, of course. and. Uh, can we use MS noise to get a seismicity, uh, I mean, seismic uh, velocity uh, model up to yes. a depth for uh, like 10 kilometers or even more? Can you explain about this? Yeah, yeah so indeed, you, you could use MS noise to compute cross correlation functions in different, in different frequency bands and look at the dispersion curve. So you see the, the this slower uh, long periods, uh, sorry, sh um, high frequency and, and faster, usually faster long periods. Um, the issue with uh, noise-based tomography or a noise-based 1D model is that your, your first few hundred meters are not well resolved because it's, it requires two high frequencies and certainly on your, on your volcanoes, it doesn't really transmit so well. And uh, there is a, a big, a big um, uh, leakage of energy between the different uh, frequencies. But yes, of course, you can do that. And we did it, for example, for um, Antarctica. We deployed a seismic network there, of which was wide. But then we just computed the cross-correlation function between 1 and 10 seconds or so. And then we computed a 1D model. And we had at least something based on, on data that we can use and, and, and then look out at the IPA centers. So it could be done for sure, yes. So if you see my screen now. Okay, so this is this is the paper we published. So what what happened here is that um, we have these old instruments that are Galitzin instrument. There was a galvanometric instrument, and we re recomputed the the uh, instrument response. But the most in striking thing is this storm here. Let me just increase a bit. So this storm here in 1953, we think meteorologists think it started either here or here or here. They don't know, 
Then it passed in the Faroe and then Scotland and went down to towards Denmark. And at some point on the 31st of January 1953, it reached the coast. So the waters reached the coast of Netherlands, England, and Belgium, and and um, resulted in a dramatic flooding that killed 2,000 people. So it was very very dramatic. Actually, for those of you who know a bit the history of the Netherlands, this event was the very starting point of the Delta Plan. So the the plan to protect the lowlands of the Netherlands with all these dikes and all these gates that they have on the rivers and the, and the sea. And so in the end, what we could achieve by scanning digit, uh, old seismometers is that these are the three components of a 1953 paper record. And we reconstruct the spectrum, spectrogram, and we compare that with an oceanic model. And we can see that the basic high energy, for example, seven, eight seconds is well reproduced. So we can use that instrument to understand the state of the ocean in 1953. And if we compare the, uh, that's the position of the, of the um, storms. And then if we compare um, the energy here in different colors, in uh, different means, different components. And also this is second plot is the most important for us is this the dominant period of the oscillations. And you see that the red is the model and blue and green are the mean and medians. And you see that we are very well reproducing what a theoretical model based on just the coastal information provides, but we have a much, much, much finer grain information. We have basically minute resolution, while the model is probably three hour resolution. So this is, this is something we did. And the way we did it is to use uh, Python code using uh, scikit image. So this is an open source library to scan, digitize, um, so we had the scanned version, and then we have some vectorization of the of the of the um, image, uh, and then you have to to locate it in time, uh, and so then you have your your uh, data. We have entered a project to the uh, Belgian uh, funding agency uh, this year to um, to add a layer of machine learning, image recognition, and pattern recognition to these figures. So I hope this will go through because whenever I know all of you know me so whenever we will have that the code will be available for all and as the same way as people have recently shared an automatic picker for pns waves we will share an automatic image analyzer for extracting uh, data from paper records and i think this could be a very much interest for all your roles of observatory data yeah uh Small question, uh, do you have any uh, requirements for the image resolution for, for the seismogram? Um, it depends. For, for the for the Galitzin, for example, because I was looking at eight second noise, 300 dpi is enough because it's super slow. But if you're looking at, uh, if I remember well, the, the images of Kawaijian volcano, you need to, to, uh, to 1200, so 1200 dpi. Yeah, because uh, on the seismogram uh, paper, we have like records of different uh, size of 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 needles, you no? Know? <laughs> yes. And and that makes the the some of of them are not readable, not uh, clear enough to 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 be seen. I I hope that the, the so this first paper was really the proof of concept. I hope our second uh, project will go through because we will start to put like for example smoked paper. Uh, but also cases that we will gather from the world. So I hope I can I can ask you some 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 scans uh, that we can also put there because we want the this software to be able to work with different data. Okay, uh, sure. Uh, thank you, Thomas. Uh, and uh, we are six minutes uh, behind. Uh, yeah, the end of, of this webinar. So uh, I have a, a question. It's uh, about the your publication on on, on, on the social uh, seismology, mm -hmm. and uh, have this result uh, been used by by like uh, decision makers just to, for example, to correlate? Are there any correlation between uh, correlations between the uh, the the uh, the, uh, the decrease of seismic uh, noise with with the infection rates, for example, mm -hmm. or other things, or uh, are the uh, is there any result that uh, reinforce the low? Uh, I mean, uh, reinforce the actions of of, of decision makers uh, based on 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 this publication. So. so um... The first thing I want to say is that we didn't want to do that because we are geophysicists and it's not my field. So I wanted to stay away from decisions, but indeed, yeah. So there's been a few cases and the one that comes in my mind is, is in Ireland. 
um, they, they, uh, one, one of these ad the advisors of the government knew about the study uh, and used that argument, but without really showing data, saying that um, the seismologists know that we uh, uh, citizens are doing good or not. So it was kind of like, you are, you are, you are being watched kind of, of message. Uh, although in, in, that, in the very specific Irish case, there was a mistake because actually there was, a, there was just an industry next to the station that was just picking up and it, it could do it. Uh, it was not the whole people. So that's also tricky because all stations are sensitive to very, very lots of sources. And if you have one construction work next to your station, it looks like the whole city is busy again, but it's not the case. Um, I know that in some places um, it was used, but I, I have no proofs of that. So we just uh, rumors or things that, for example, uh, I think in in, um, in Sicily, the, the colleagues from the Etna had discussions with the authorities, as any case they have for the volcano, and this was mentioned also. Um, no, I don't I don't have uh, numbers, uh, and also we haven't computed the comparison between the rates uh, and the measures. What is interesting is the studies that have been started now, because going into lockdown was sharp, everyone was home, and then going out of lockdown was progressive. So the studies that we are doing now are to identify the different composition of the mixture. Is it a train? Is it a tram? Is it the cars? Is it the planes? What is the mixture we are looking at? And for example, here in Brussels, um, during the whole summer, we have set up a microphone next to the pavillon behind me. Uh, we've put that there to correlate the audible noise, so the feeling people have, and the seismic records. Okay, uh, Tom, uh, that's the final question. And uh, do you have any, um, yeah, for the, this is the last question. Maybe you have a uh, final remarks of your talk. Um, yes, I think this is uh, an, a message of hope for everyone uh, working in, in, uh, in the fields that we, that I know best, of course, seismology, but also uh, in, in, in coding and everything. Never be ashamed to ask a question. Never be ashamed to fail coding, but you should just contact people there, take risks, contact us, contact anyone and, and share your stuff because everyone will be, will be um, will benefit from it, including you, but also the whole community. And I think this is, uh, as a community and seismology has always been at the forefront of community, uh, the spirit, we, are, we have been sharing seismograms for 100 years and sending paper records all over the world. Now we have the chance to have internet. This is also what allows us to continue working um, this connection we have all together. And I think this is for the young generation following us and the students, um, push, 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 even if the old guys don't want to share, push. Okay, thank you, uh, Thomas, for your uh, very uh, inspiring last uh, remarks. Uh, we uh, uh, are very delighted with, with your talk, and we hope to see you again in the future uh, talks. And, um, and for all the audience, uh, before we end uh, this uh, webinar, I would like to share you that uh, next week we will have uh, another webinar series. Uh, so this uh, webinar will be in Indonesian. Uh, it's uh, about the, the lessons learned from the past uh, earthquakes in, uh, in Palu. So we will, uh, we will, it's not, we will commemorate the, uh, the, the, the two years of, of, of the, uh, the big earthquake in Palu that uh, created a lot of uh, uh, damages and uh, deaths. So uh, that's all I think uh, for for uh, for me. And uh, before we end, we will uh, we would like also to share the link for the uh, uh, e certificates. So the host may share the uh, link of the certificates. Uh, so for those of you who needs. Uh, the certificates are also uh, for the presentation file. You uh, can see on the screen uh, this e-certificate registration. And if you have already registered, then you uh, will be able to download the certificate. And if you want to download the uh, presentation file from Dr. Thomas Lecoq, uh, there is also the, the link on it. And e-certificate can be requested up to 5 p.m. today. So uh, 
after five, the link will be uh, unavailable. And if you have uh, other questions related to, uh, to this webinar, you can ask our uh, contact persons. There are three people here, and uh, but we have uh, we will give you only 24 hours of, of yeah of services. So uh, thank you again for your attention. Uh, see you again in uh, the next webinar. Goodbye. Okay, uh, thank you, Thomas. We are for the presentation.